Hello, welcome back to Piers Rocks. In response to recent videos where I lay out PCBs for my retro ROM replacement one ROM, I've had loads of comments telling me how many emissions I'm going to be generating through the fact that I'm using a two layer PCB. Now, I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars of RF equipment. I don't have a PhD in RF research and I don't have a cat named Pooch to help me. But I do have a hundred dollar spectrum analyzer from AliExpress. So let's see what we can see. This is the 28 pin version of one ROM, which is the most recent one that I laid out and attracted a whole bunch of comments around potential emissions. Now, just to put to bed any concerns about nearby hospital patients, I live in mid Wales. We don't have to worry about inconveniences like hospitals around here. I'm pretty sure that the nearest hospital is about 50 miles away. Now, the theory is that because I don't have a dedicated ground layer on this PCB, that I end up with large loop areas between the traces going out and the returns coming back via the ground traces and planes that I do have. These ground loops end up acting as antennae for the signals and broadcast them to all and sundry. I'm going to point out that this PCB, no matter how big it looks on your 60 inch 4K monitor, is 19 millimeters by about 37 millimeters. That's about three quarters of an inch by an inch and a half. So the area of any loop is inherently limited by the size of the PCB. In fact, the routing area of this PCB is even smaller than that. In terms of emission strength, emission strength is proportional to the area of the loop. Emission strength is also proportional to the signal current. This is not a particularly high power application. I've been pretty rigorous in retaining ground pores on the bottom and top layers wherever I can stitching the layers together well and generally ensuring that the return path is as short as possible for all signals. I'm pretty skeptical that emissions from this board are going to be significant, particularly when compared to the retro systems that they're running within. But let's see. Before we start testing one ROM, I just want to check that Spectrum Analyzer is giving us sensible results. So I'm scanning the five gigahertz region at the moment. I'm going to kick off a speed test on my phone over Wi-Fi. It's kicked off now. The antenna is probably about a foot away from the iPhone. So we should see some activity appearing at 5.2 ish gigahertz. And there we go. That's the uh, speed test happening over five gigahertz Wi-Fi. I'm going to do near field and far field testing. And they are what they sound like. Far field testing is a significant distance from the item under test. And near field testing is right up next to the item under test. When going through formal emissions testing, far field testing is the one that's done. And that's typically done at 3 metres, 10 metres and 30 metres. Here, I'm going to be doing far field testing at 1 metre. So the C64 is going to be over there. And the antenna and the spectrum analyzer are going to be sitting on my bench. All testing is going to be done with this C64C motherboard. Now, there's no explicit shielding on this motherboard. I've stripped all of that, except there is some shielding on the RF modulator component. Right now, the stock ROMs are installed, the character ROM and the combined 28-pin kernel basic ROM. So my testing is going to test three scenarios. I'm going to test the emissions with the Commodore 64 off. I'm going to test it with the stock kernel and basic ROM installed. And we're going to test with one ROM replacing this kernel and basic test. And we'll take a look at the 0 to 1 gigahertz spectrum. And we'll also drill down and look at the sort of 0 to 200 megahertz sort of region. And we'll look at the differences between all three scenarios. System turned off. System turned on with the original ROMs installed. System turned on serving the one ROM kernel and basic ROM. So system's all set up. It's turned off. It's about a meter away from the spectrum analyzer's antenna. You can see the noise floor in this room, the background noise that I'm getting. I've got a whole bunch of equipment turned on so that I can do recording. I also have the Spectrum Analyzer plugged in via a shielded USB-C cable. Despite the fact it's shielded, it may still propagate some USB and other signals into the Spectrum Analyzer. But because we're comparing the... Spectrum analyzes output between the three scenarios. We'll be able to see if there is additional noise injected by both the Commodore 64 and by one ROM. I have the resolution bandwidth set pretty high 
on the spectrum analyzer that means it's sampling large chunks of the spectrum at any one time that means we get relatively frequent updates on the display but systems turned off this is the sort of noise that we're getting and i'll turn the commodore 64 on and you'll see the screen has the familiar blue background of the commodore 64 once it's booted System's booted now. This is with the stock ROM. I struggled to see any difference really. I'll overlay the different graphs in editing, but the difference for me between turned off and turned on are pretty minimal. One ROM's installed, let's turn it on. Well, I struggled to see any difference then. No, I didn't see any difference. So now we'll reduce the span of the spectrum analyzer down to zero to 200 megahertz, seeing as that's where the majority of the background noise seems to be. And we'll see if we see any differences there. And now the spectrum analyzer is set to from zero to 200 megahertz. The system is off, so you can see the sort of background noise I'm getting. Let's turn it on. I saw very little then. Right, let's install one ROM, see if it changes. One ROM's installed. Turning it on. I didn't see any difference really. For near field testing, I'm going to use this near field testing probe. I picked up a bunch of these on Amazon. Again, they're only like $10, so they're not the world's best near field probes by any stretch of the imagination. This particular probe is the one that gives highest emissions readings on previous tests of previous one ROMs, which is why I'm using this one. It's going to be suspended directly over the ROM in question, like this, probably be about a centimetre from the centre of the PCB, directly over the RP2350 microcontroller. It will be suspended in a similar location for the power off tests and for the original ROM tests. The C64 itself is going to be out of shot here just because of the setup. I can't get it over here and also have the spectrum analyzer plugged into USB so you can see the output of it. I have the near field probe set up directly above the original ROM chip in the C64. It's turned off at the moment and we're scanning 0 to 1 gigahertz. I'll turn the Commodore 64 on. Again, this is the original ROM chip. All right, so we see a bit of noise in the zero to 200 megahertz region with the Commodore 64 turned on and the original ROM installed. I'll now run exactly the same test, same range, same resolution bandwidth with one ROM installed. And I'm gonna try and leave the near field probe right where it is. Now this will actually mean that the one ROM is slightly closer to the probe because it sits slightly prouder in the ROM socket than the original ROM. So it'll be closer to the probe, so we'll expect slightly higher signal readings if there's a whole bunch of noise coming from one ROM. One ROM's installed. Turn it on. And we get to my eye a similar level of activity in the zero to 200 megahertz region. Now you'll have the benefit in editing, I'll have stuck the two graphs above each other so you'll be able to see if there's anything significant between the two. But I'm struggling to see it from this. I'm now going to run the same test again from 0 to 200 megahertz. So we zoom in on the region where we are seeing a bunch of additional activity with the original ROM and with one ROM. Original ROM chip reinstalled and we're looking at 0 to 200 megahertz. I'll turn the Commodore 64 on. And we see a bunch of additional noise, basically broadband noise across at least the majority of that 0 to 200 megahertz spectrum. One ROM reinstalled. Let's turn it on. It's all very similar. It's possible that we're seeing maybe three decibels more noise across the, the early part of the spectrum when one ROM is installed. But honestly, it's pretty 
close. I don't think by any stretch of the imagination that you can now accuse this PCB of spraying emissions all over the place. At least with the equipment I've got, I reckon I would struggle to see any difference whatsoever between a two layer and a four layer PCB. Now, does that mean that a two layer PCB would pass emissions testing? I don't know. I don't have enough experience in this to be sure. But given the cheap and cheerful equipment that I've got, at least for far field testing, I can't detect any difference whatsoever between the Commodore 64 running without one ROM and the Commodore 64 running with one ROM. Now, theoretically, I could create some kind of test jig for one ROM that drives it without a Commodore 64 running. But then I've got to worry about the emissions from the test jig itself. If I just put some firmware on one ROM that emulates its behavior and pretends to serve bytes and twiddles GPIOs high and low, I'm not going to get any current being sunk out of the data pins. So again, that's not going to be a valid test either. There's a separate question of whether it's worth avoiding a four layer PCB here and whether the cost difference actually makes it worthwhile. Now, to those of you who tell me that JLC will make me five four layer PCBs for a total of $2, well, yes, they will, but only as the first PCB in any order and only for five. As soon as you go above five, you start paying their normal prices. F five boards is not very useful if I want to manufacture these things in quantities for sale. I've taken a look at JLC's prices for two layer and four layer PCBs for lots of different options and for different quantities. And certainly where you select very common options like green PCBs and hazel with lead tinning of the pads, then the prices for four layer PCBs are very, very close to the prices for two layer PCBs. But as soon as you go outside of the norm and you want say red PCBs or you want Enig plating of your pads, then you're into special service fees from JLC and the prices of the PCBs ramp up significantly. So that's kind of up to you. You pays your money, you takes your choice. Right from day one with one ROM, I've challenged myself as much as possible, both to stretch my own abilities and because I find difficult things fun. There's no fun to me in laying out uh, a PCB on an extremely large board with lots of different layers if there's only a few components on it. I want to optimize right down to the minimum possible requirements. And I think that's a two layer PCB, at least for the 24 pin and 28 pin versions of one ROM. Will it be doable for versions of one ROM with more pins? And will there be versions of one ROMs with more pins? There might be. I don't think two layer PCBs are going to be viable for those larger ROMs. Now, finally, regular viewers may realize that this means that the 28 pin prototype that I laid out a few weeks ago is back from fab and it is functioning properly. Yes, indeed it is. So right now it's emulating a 23128 in this Commodore 64C. I've tested 2764, 27128, 27256 and 27512 and one ROM seems to operate perfectly well as all of those different ROM types. My ability to test those sorts of ROMs though is actually quite limited. I don't have much equipment that uses these larger 28 pin ROMs. If you would like to get hold of a 28 pin one ROM, and I'm sure you will. I'm going to put two of my prototypes for sale, links down in the description, to coincide with the release of this video. So I expect they will go very, very quickly. And I'm planning to order a larger batch of these so that more people can get their hands on them and can test them out and let me know how they get on. Please do only buy one of the prototype 28 pin one ROMs if you're willing to hit bugs and willing to actually do some testing and help me if there turn out to be problems, get through those problems. If you're not interested in doing that, please hold off until there are some more available. I hope you found this video interesting and useful. As always, if you did, please do consider sticking around. Till next time, rock on.